Welcome to chapter 15, the final chapter of the sequence. And this is ultimately the bottom end of the funnel or the top of the triangle, depending on how you're looking at it. All throughout this book, it has been a process of fundamentally heading towards a set of services marketing logics. And one of the key logics that this chapter is based on is the pursuit of the world-class standard. Now, as I mentioned early in the season, uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be your end goal. That one of the uh, ideological principles that underpins marketing is the perpetual pursuit of either growth or excellence. Whereas the market itself quite often will support you in staying, satisfying and delivering rather than necessarily putting the risks on the table that re are required to get you to that next level of growth or world standard. So ultimately, if we look at it from the perspective of the seamless service, assuming that the purpose of your service is customer satisfaction uh, and company success and company longevity, what you want is the seamlessness that comes from the service being able to be delivered without interruption, without, the customer should be aware of it, the customer should know that they are in a service so that they are co-producing and co-creating as required, but they should not necessarily see some of the, the seams, the behind the scenes, the strings and the wires holding it together. So to that end, what you're looking for is to establish a process in the services marketing protocol that enables you to provide the product in a high touch or low touch or anywhere on the spectrum between an environment where the customer is present, the customer potentially can observe the process, but the customer, unless the process is a feature in and of itself, the customer won't have a need to engage in it. So, a couple of the things that are Seamlessness is a, it's a holistic position. Uh, it's possibly even a philosophical position inside marketing. Managerialism, departmentalization, and functionalism are also approaches that can be taken. Again, one of the things I really want to highlight is that there are values to each of these processes. There are times products and services that best suit different approaches. Seamlessness may really work for the service that you want to offer. At the same time, departmentalization has worked for the organizations. Uh, if we take something like an institute of higher education, you want there to be a seamlessness around the education experience, but you want there to be clear departmentalization around one bit does the teaching, one bit does the service provision, one bit does the infrastructure to support the service, so that the lecturer that you are relying on can, for your teaching experience, can point you to another function that, as and when it needs to be activated, and it's not, it's seamless in so far as the transfers are smooth, but it's departmentalized in so far as your contact, your contact employee doesn't have to have the responsibility for everything. So silo mentalities, again, some of these silo mentalities have values. Uh, if you want seamless multi-integrated, there's also certain points where it's just not logistically, the organization is bigger the organization is stronger than the protocol you can um, necessarily implement through having a seamless holistic approach. So the key, you'll note here that uh, also one of the things to always question when you are reading a set of theories, logics and frameworks, if the framework that's the last dot point is the most superior and it's bring everything together. I always 
initially question it and say, well, what's the values attached to each of this? So service logic is the seamlessness by marketing operations and human resources. And I'm sitting here looking at this going, so basically what you're saying is all three logistics are important, all three logics are important. Slapping a fourth logic over the top as command and control could actually just be interfering. So fundamentally, uh, the balance, and we've raised a lot of these issues across the semester. Human resources versus operations versus marketing, yes, they need to be balanced. There are going to be times where HR should overrule marketing and operations, where the laws of how much you can pay someone, how much you, the minimum you pay, the maximum number of hours they can work, health and safety, these are functions where HR should come in and operations should not be able to overrule it. And marketing can't say, look, can we just ignore those laws for a couple of hours, days, weeks, months, years? So there are points where, similarly, from marketing's perspective, there is no value to a firm that can't have a value offer in the market that the customers want. You can be operationally perfect, but if no one's interested in your product, not going to happen. Same on the HR side, there are the need for marketing to work with HR so that what you are attempting to produce as a product can be supported by the staff infrastructure you've got. But the marketing side can't get a value offer into the marketplace for whatever reason, then you need to go back and review, is this a product that can be offered? Yeah, in which case marketing has a responsibility to fix the job if HR is like, no, nah, you're not getting that done out of us. Uh, similarly, operations can't overrule HR and can't overrule management because a super efficient service that doesn't provide anything somebody wants is not an effective service and efficiency and effectiveness needs to balance. Similarly, some of the things out of operations uh, risks the idea of it gets measured, it gets done, so that if the measure of efficiency is number of phone calls and speed of termination of phone call, that's not going to get you sales or that's not going to get you customer satisfaction. That will get you hang up and redial, hang up and redial as a metric or an, an operationalization of your metric of speed plus volume. So let's talk services triangle, the last of the big ticket frameworks in this. This is the culmination. This, now, if you ever want to go from write a services marketing textbook, the services triangle could form the fundamentals, could form the core of a textbook. Because here what you're looking at is the balance between the system, the strategy, and the employee. Each line in the triangle, including meeting in the center, is an interaction. Uh, it's also, as a measurement variable, you can track to what extent is the service strategy or the employee strategy or the system, where are you on that line, where is the customer in this line? So we need to always look at these things from the point of view of how would you use this theory? You're looking for balance, but you can accept it going to one of the particular elements if that's valuable for a temporary point. So first of all, uh, service strategy to customer, you need customers to know what it is you offer, why you offer it, how you offer it. There's a level of persuasion, information and communication. The, whatever you tell the customer, you need to make certain the employees are as equally briefed, if not better briefed. The way a, a service fails on a routine basis is a customer comes in knowing more about what's going to happen at the service, having been receiving a bunch of emails of promotional offers that weren't communicated to the employees, so the employees don't know what's going on, that is a service failure. Straight up, that will cause you a service gap to occur. Line three. So once you've set your strategy and you've communicated it out to your staff and to your 
customers, your systems need to have the capacity to deliver it. So if you're offering one free coffee with every loyalty card swiped, tapped or scanned, and you don't have the infrastructure to scan, then it's going to be failure. You're setting up for failure. So your systems always need to be informed by your strategy. If your strategy cannot be implemented by your systems, then your strategy should change. So similarly, the between system and customer, whenever the customer is interacting with your service systems, the customer should get benefit out of it. It should be for the enhancement of the service system. Uh, if you're not getting value, if it's not creating value, if it's not supporting a value offer, then it needs to change. Across the base, uh, rules and regulations should support and facilitate the employees. The employees are the means by which the systems get enacted. Uh, and this is a critical thing to consider is that you have a direction here from systems to customer, you have a direction here from employee to system to customer. The systems are a means by which the employees get the job done. So they should be in support of the overall service strategy. Because as well as thinking about this as a triangle, think about it as a mapping mechanism. So if the customer wants to receive the service product, uh, that's going to come through the system, system interaction to customer. That's a self-service model. Uh, if it's going to be that to get the customer wants the product, the product is created by the skills of the employees using the systems back to the customer. Or if it's created, it's a product created by employees directly to customers, then you've got different lines of effect, different journeys. So through this model. Because line six is the critical instance, the moments of truth, it's the interaction between the customer and the service provider. And usually that's embedded and embodied in the form of people, but it can also be through the form of uh, systems. And there's a certain level to which that there is customer co-creation in here. Fundamentally, the things that you control are the elements of the triangle and the pathway through the triangle. So the final phase that I want to talk about is the service audits. Uh, the key things on a service audit here is these are questions to be answered and your strategy determines whether your answer is a good answer or an answer that can be improved. So you want to overall be using an audit as a method for seeing whether you engage the service strategy you intended to set out to engage, whether you have deviated from that strategy, whether uh, there's been a natural evolution of change, and whether there's an opportunity to capture that change into a formal strategy for going forward. So your questions on the profit and growth component here, the questions that are on the screen, basically are, what makes a customer come back? How do we determine if that's the right approach? Uh, we've got the things like the leaky bucket model, which we've uh, raised in other chapters. What's the expenditure? Are we keeping, retaining? Are we, when a customer leaves, do we know why? Do we know if it's a temporary or a permanent exit? What do we know about how many people we are retaining, keeping, and if we're planning on growing, what's required of us? Satisfaction, this is an important thing. This is the outcome. Now, in many respects, the uh, in goods-based marketing, the outcome is sell the product. Here, because you are expecting that the product is something that's going to be engaged repeatedly, if you have a customer loyalty orientation to your strategy, satisfaction is mission critical. You need them to be sufficiently content with the service that when the problem recurs, they want to come back. 
If you have a transactional based approach, because your problem is something that gets solved and then once it's solved, it's solved. What you're looking for in your customer satisfaction is the level of satisfaction that will encourage endorsement and word of mouth. You also want to understand how are you collecting, what's your protocol, um, a lot of the stuff around the, the chapters on service satisfaction raise a bunch of these questions, but what's your process and how does this feed forward and feed back into the company? Now, value perceptions here, this is, um, so we've got the surf qual emerging here. Uh, we've got the service recovery, which came out a couple of chapters ago. We're also looking at customer perception, customer perception tracking and mapping, and how that information informs decisions within the firm. Now, obviously, the larger the firm, the more formalized the knowledge management system you'll need, the more formal the infrastructure. But even a small firm, what are we doing to track how people feel, how people uh, regard the value, if it's good value, worthwhile value, how are we capturing that information and passing it on? And how are we capturing it to make use of it inside something like the service gaps model? The what gets measured, what gets done risk is here. So how, given the service is based, uh, it's a human-based service uh, and a skill-based service, how is productivity measured? Are you measuring it in terms of satisfaction outcomes, products sold, sales units? Your question here uh, will determine what you value and what you measure, and that what you measure and what you value will drive what employees will want to achieve. The other question that you've got to ask yourself in here is, again, you've got customer satisfaction. This is effectively employee satisfaction, uh, or the outcome of employee satisfaction. This is loyalty. What do we do to retain the staff we have because the staff are the product? If you think about this from a commercial marketing, goods-based oriented marketing firm, you would be looking at this in terms of supply lines, quality assurance, quality of manufacturing equipment, quality of raw materials. Same deal here. The employee is the manufacturing process and the raw material of your service. If you do not have a loyal employee or you're not working to retain employees, then you are creating yourself a high churn in your providers of service quality. Similarly, satisfaction and the, so satisfaction and loyalty are linked. When you are looking at this program as well, what extent is the customer satisfaction measurement going to also be linked to employee satisfaction? Uh, I remind you that uh, in the service scape, the approach avoid uh, protocol of a service scape has a whole bunch of factors around how it influences your employee. So if your employee is satisfied and your customers are satisfied, you're getting employee loyalty and customer loyalty, how are you measuring and then subsequently rewarding? The internal service quality, uh, think this back to your service gap model where you're looking at do the systems and then service triangle, do the systems enable the employee to get the job done? Do they support? Do they enhance? Do they create something? The uh, management side, management leadership, the question here is to what extent are the people who are in charge of the firm, who are removed from the front line of the firm, enabling the optimum service quality at the front end? Now, this is also a stepwise thing of it's quite often, it's quite common to have a frontline employee and a top tier manager embodying the same values, which are not embodied by the middle management. Uh, so you have someone trying to deliver the service outcome A believe is right based on what they've heard the CEO say. Their managers and the management tiers above them may hold different views 
and that's where you're going to run into some service leadership problems and service leadership clash. There's also, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in management theory about leadership and how it works to draw on here as well. The final part of the service audit is service performance is a functional element and its function is to ensure that the company continues to survive by turning profitability, by covering costs, by ensuring minimized losses, by making certain that if you are solving a problem by providing a service and you're doing it well, that you're also able to do it again tomorrow, the next day, and for when the problem recurs for the customer. So the link to profitability is the final step here. Do all these other audit elements when everything's all done and dusted, all considered, is it connecting to the firm's ability to continue to function? So a couple of final things to draw on here are basically the cultural framework. Service culture is an important facet. Uh, it comes from formal and informal processes. It comes from systems. It comes from people. But it's also the nature of the organization. One of the biggest failings in services marketing uh, the implementation of services, marketing principles during day-to-day uh, -day work is that you can have a structure, you can have systems, but if your culture doesn't support the use of that structure, your culture doesn't support the use of that system, then your people probably aren't going to connect to it. People aren't going to see a value. If you set up a knowledge management system that's highly detailed, highly complicated, uh, but your employees see no point in filling out the data, it's going to produce worthless data at the end. It's going to produce biased data. You'll have structure, you'll have systems, but if your culture isn't supporting the, isn't enabling your employee to act towards the overall organizational goal, it's where you run into problems. So a couple of things um, here is that if the, you know, again, philosophical thing, the idea of marketing as a whole of firm organization versus marketing as a departmental function, uh, marketing as the central core, the services marketing group as the central core, the lifeblood, the heartbeat versus it being the external audit. This is a philosophical thing. It's bigger than one slide. It's something you need to look at in terms of the organization, its current culture, how it came about. Uh, quite often what you'll find is that if you've come from a very production, product-oriented, I have a skill, I have found the market for it, then the idea of modifying your skill based on the advice of an external third party, e.g. the marketing department, runs contrary to how you might feel, uh, how you felt you got to your success in the first place and how you feel you should be ongoing success. Uh, the other element here in terms of cultural change, there's a lot of stuff out of leadership and management that crosses over into here, so it's always worth engaging that. But here, one of the things to consider is not just what gets measured gets done, but what gets rewarded gets done. So if your infrastructure your social infrastructure isn't built around helping the employee see a connection between what they do and the ongoing success of the firm, you need to revamp and revisit. And finally, uh, there are direct interventions. I'm gonna suggest that if you wanna do this, take one of our management leadership subjects Services marketing fundamentally, at the end of the day, is about people interacting with customers in an environment and an organization that can either help or hinder that process of interaction and can help or hinder the process of perceiving that that was a high quality, worthwhile, good interaction and something we should do again and repeatedly. So as the added element, the fifth the fifth P on the marketing, extended marketing mix, people. People are fundamental to services marketing. Culture and cultural change is fundamental to the services framework. And to the other aspect here is that I've talked a lot about cultural change, but also cultural defense. As your organization grows, 
and you bring in people who weren't there as, at the beginning or you bring in outsiders, if you've got a successful corporate culture underway, you need to also look at how do we maintain support and preserve the culture of success that got us to the growth, to the expansion, to the success that we have enabled. And that is the closeout on the content for the chapters. Uh, finishing up on service culture, because fundamentally services is, service firms are about people. People, when combined together into an ongoing functional unit, create culture. Culture is what will drive the success or failure of a services marketing organization.